Chapter 3 is an interesting chapter, to say the least, and in a sense, it is the complete history of Israel summarized. Let's get right into verse 1, Hosea 3 and verse 1, and it says, Then the Lord said to me, Go again, love a woman who is loved by a lover and is committing adultery, just like the love of the Lord for the children of Israel, who look to other gods and love the raisin cakes of the pagans. So this is the parallel carried out in the life of Hosea, as we saw previously in chapters 1 and 2. What we see, though, is that God still loves Israel through thick and thin. He understands that they are a carnal people, that they don't have the heart and the necessary component to actually be able to love him. That means to abide by his laws. The ones that they assented to you know, earlier in the, the Pentateuch. So they said, yes, we will do all that the Lord has said. And God says, okay, I will do what I have said. But they, again, they go astray. And this is the story of Israel throughout the Old Testament, is that there is this going towards God and going away from God. And eventually they go away from God until the very end. Now notice also in Jeremiah 7, verse 18. In fact, I'll just read it for you. I think this may be what Hosea is referring to, or we can say God through Hosea, when he says, who looked to other gods and loved the raisin cakes of the pagans. Of course, that's italicized and it was put to try to make it more clear. But in Jeremiah 7, 18, it says, the children gather wood, the fathers kindled the fire, the women knead dough to make cakes for the queen of heaven. And then they pour out their drink offerings to the other gods. And they provoke me to anger by doing these things. So I always find it kind of interesting that during the days of unleavened bread, it's hot cross buns. So they put a cross, which is a pagan symbol, on buns, which are leavened during the days of unleavened bread. So they, they get things completely backwards or they, they make a semblance of what it is that they were supposed to be doing. But they interject their own beliefs or pagan beliefs into it, and it completely throws everything out of whack. And of course, it displeases God when they go astray and they don't follow his word. So back to Hosea 3 and verse 2. So, he says, I bought her for myself for 15 shekels of silver and one and a half omers of barley. So why is it then, the question is, does he have to buy her back? Well, it's because she was in a slave market. Okay, so it, it's a rough time that's coming and it will be so bad that they won't even be wanted as slaves. And, and think about this, okay? We're, we're talking about modern day Israel now. That would be the UK and the US. That some of the people are so out of shape and and from a working point of, point, working point of view, so useless that they won't even be wanted as slaves. And so here we're talking about 15 shekels, which is half the price for a slave. So it's, it's 15 shekels plus 15 ephah of the cheapest grain. That's what one and a half omers comes out to be. Verse three, and I said to her, you shall stay with me many days. You shall not play the harlot, nor shall you have a man. So too will I be toward you. So he is intimating that there's going to be this time of testing. Okay, she won't play the harlot, but it appears that he's not going to have that really close relationship with her until she proves herself and regains his trust. Now, God's always there. He's always in control of what's going on. So it's not like he ever completely removes himself from, you know, knowing what's, what's happening. Okay, so he has to because there are things in the past that he has made as promises that he must fulfill in the future. And so he must see these things. And, and as a part of the chastisement, again, he removes himself to a certain degree. But they have to go through and regain his trust and go through this time of repentance. Verse 4, For the children of Israel shall bide many days without a king or prince, without sacrifice or sacred pillar, without ephod or teraphim. So now, 
this is interesting. This this one singular verse right here has continued to be fulfilled since before the time of Christ when Israel went into captivity. So they go into captivity with Assyria. Of course, you know, they don't get to have a king during that time. But as we know, they never come back to the land of Israel, to Jerusalem, to be, you know, God's people again and to have a king like they had under King David, right? And, and they don't get to, to live their life as they should be living it. And what we see now is that this has continued to be fulfilled. Okay, this is the many days without the king or prince. And it's going to continue until the return of Christ. So in a sense, I mean, I look at this as further proof that the Bible is true. I think it's interesting, too, that uh, when, whenever I happen to come across uh, a Jew, a Jew, an Orthodox Jew, um, somebody who kind of knows their Bible, and, and again, you know, the most recent one, I'm sitting next to one on the plane, and, you know, he's saying all the names in Hebrew and everything, and then I ask him, I said, okay, you know, you're, you're a Jew of the tribe of Judah. Where are the other tribes of Judah? Where are they today? Who are they? And invariably, I get this blank stare. And, and, and then they go immediately talking about the Jews of Judah in Israel. And so they don't even, to a large degree, know or understand this, that the children of Israel have been scattered up into Northwest Europe, where they remain until this day, and waiting for, even though, even though they don't know that they're waiting for, the return of Christ to, again, take them out of a captivity that is coming. So there's an enslavement that's going to happen, and he's going to bring them all back to Israel, the ones who make it through the Great Tribulation and the Day of the Lord that survive and, and go back to Israel and now have this repentant and good attitude. So while though they are in captivity, they're not going to be afforded these many things while they're in captivity with Assyria. So they're not going to get to rule themselves. And they're not going to get to worship or practice their religion or seek answers, even from false religion. And so then from there, they would be dispersed and scattered. And again, never have this central place of worship or they would never all be together in that way until the very end. Hosea 3 in verse 5. Afterward, okay, after this time that we're talking about in verse 4, the many days, the children of Israel shall return and seek the Lord their God and David their king. All right? So again, we'll, we'll, we'll address that in just a second, but realize what was being said here. Well, this is why we have to understand chronology sometimes. They shall fear the Lord and his goodness in the latter days. So this is what we were saying before. Israel shall return. So it, they're going to return to the promised land, finally, after the return of Christ. They haven't been there since uh, they first went in captivity with Assyria. So uh, Isaiah 11, 11, you might put this in your notes. We did a whole message on the second Exodus, the one that's going to make the first one compale, pale, in comparison. But in Isaiah 11, 11, if you just want to put that in your notes, it says, and it shall come to pass, a reference to the end time, the latter days, in that day, okay, that the Lord, okay, all that's referring to the end time, shall set his hand again, once more, the second time to recover the remnant of his people who are left. Right, so he's going to Again, recover his people, the, re the remnant of his people. This is a reference to uh, them being in captivity in Egypt and the exodus that ensued thereafter. But it says, okay, now he's going to have to recover them from Assyria and Egypt, Pathros and Cush, from Elam, Shinar, Hamath, and the islands of the sea. So he's going to have to go and recover them from many places this time. And it's going to be considerably more people. The exodus was, you know, we always estimate it to be two and a half million, three million people, okay? But this one is going to make that exodus of that many people pale 
in comparison to the point, as the other scripture says, where they won't even remember the previous one. They'll only be talking about this one that's coming. And again, it's hard to get your mind around this and to believe this and to understand this, but this is what is still yet to happen in the very near future, is that Israel, okay, these lost 10 tribes and who they represent, now U.S., U.K., are going to go into captivity. They're going to be enslaved. And we can't imagine that right now as the, the thing that's on the tip of many people's tongue to make America great again. And, and we talk about the greatness. And again, this has been bestowed on us by God and through the blessings that we have incurred by coming to this country and following a godly way of life. And by, more importantly, the promises that he had made to Abraham so many years ago so many millennia ago. And so there's going to be this fall because all empires fall. We cannot be ever be mistaken about that. Think of any empire that you want in the past. They are no longer an empire today, right? So yes, it, it shouldn't be that inconceivable. It's just at this point in time, we think that we are great, but that has been by the grace of God. Anyway, after the captivity and the return of Christ, David who is actually dead at the time that this is written, right? So we have to understand that. This is what we're talking about, the chronology. David's dead and buried, right? And he continues to say dead and buried. I think just off the top of my head, it's Acts 8, 23, that, again, they said David's still buried today. So he's not up in heaven. He's in the ground waiting the resurrection and the return of Christ. But the point here is that it says in verse 5, it calls David their king. So again, this is prophetic. This is looking forward to the future. Okay, so the children of Israel return. They seek God, who is now also returned. The second return, we call it. The second coming. And David will be their king. Let's look real quick at Ezekiel 37, verse 24. Ezekiel 37, verse 24. Single verse here that just shows, again, this all goes to the plan of God and how he's working, what he's doing for the future, how things are going to be set up. So in Ezekiel 37, in verse 24, it says, David, my servant, shall be king over them. All right? And this is the one head that we talked about in Hosea 1 and verse 11, you know, it talked about the children of Judah and the children of Israel, right? The southern kingdom and the northern kingdom shall be gathered together. And this has not happened since Israel went into captivity and scattered and appoint themselves and point for themselves one head. Okay. This is a reference to David and they shall come up out of the land for great will be the day of Jezreel, meaning you know, my seed, my people. And continuing on in Ezekiel 37, verse 24, and they shall all have one shepherd. They shall all walk in my judgments and observe my statutes and do them. Okay, so again, the implication here, I think, is that that one shepherd is David, who was also a shepherd. And that's the way that God trained him to be king, was letting him be a shepherd. You know, he had this quote-unquote lowly job, but there it was being trained by God for a specific purpose, so to lead the people of God. And of course, David will be under Christ, who will be the king of kings and the Lord of lords, ruling over the whole earth, over everyone, but David over Israel. And again, when we say Israel in this connotation, we're talking about all 12 tribes, Israel and Judah together. They will no longer be separate Right? This is what we're talking about, Hosea 1.11, that they're coming together. So again, all of this is in the future. We're talking about a time yet to come. Of course, there's some things that we're going to have to go through first as a nation. Again, this is what God was doing, and this is what he was telling to Hosea, or, or to the people through Hosea at the time. Okay, If you're going to act this way, and, and you're not going to be my people, and you're going to play this harlot, specifically this spiritual harlot, that goes after foreign gods, foreign ways, and eschews my ways, okay? 
And again, this is what we're talking about also at the end of verse 24 of Ezekiel 37, is that you know they're going to walk in my judgments, my observe my statutes, and do them, all the commandments of God. And so we see what God wants. Okay, we see where his people are. We see the punishment that's going to ensue. And then we also see then the purpose for it, that it is to bring about a change, bring about repentance, bring them back to God. And then you know, God can then be their God. And then they can have this relationship and they can no longer be at odds with him because they are observing the things that he commanded. And, and this is all he wants. He wants the best way for them. Okay, And this is the best way. All right? It's not some type of onerous regulations that God foist on mankind just for no reason. It's because it is the best way, whether they realize it or not. They knew these things, they were told these things, and they went away from these things. And that's why these things were going to come upon them. The impending captivity, and then this going away for all this time that we were talking about in the previous verse, in verse 3, uh, or verse um, 5, 4, 5, all, all, the, all these verses here. The, the abiding many days, which is verse 4, without a prince or a king or the, the temple until this time of the end. So here they are for over 2,500 years out of the mix. But the time's coming, and I'm telling you very soon, and this is why we're looking at some of these things, it, it should be a wake-up call to us that we look at these things because, yes, we are a modern Israel. We're part of modern Israel. And we are falling into the same exact trap that ancient Israel fell into. And again, th there's not in many ways any difference here. We, we are the same people. God is still speaking to us. He still wants this relationship with us if we just had an ear to hear. If we don't, then right here in the words of your Bible, we're going to find out what's going to happen. So now let's move on to chapter four. So now we're kind of moving away from, to a certain degree, moving away from, you know, chapters one and two, where he kind of lays the groundwork that, okay, this is how things look, all right? This is how they are. This is the way you're acting. So now he begins to then make a case for this. He said, you're acting like the spiritual harlot, like this. So if they don't actually know what this means, then here we begin in chapter 4 and verse 1, and we see then that God says, okay, let me tell you how it is and why it is that these things are going to happen, and also what's going to happen. So chapter 4, verse 1 says, Hear the word of the Lord, you children of Israel. For the Lord brings a charge against the inhabitants of the land. There is no truth or mercy or knowledge of God in the land. So he says, okay, listen, inhabitants of land. He's addressing all the people here. And, and then he'll kind of break it out a little bit and, and pull some people out specifically who should have a greater responsibility, as we'll see. Now, why is there a problem? All right. Well, the problem is, and again, you put Amos 3 at 10, won't, won't bother to go there. It says, for they do not know to do right. Okay? This is, this is problematic because at one point they did know to do right. They knew what the way was, and then they just didn't do it. Now, they don't know. Okay? There is no truth. There is no mercy, and there is no knowledge. So they've gone way down this path and barring some type of uh, renewal, rejuvenation, revitalization, like the, like kind of happened under Josiah, they're going to, you know, with this reintroduction of the law of God when he found the, the law in the, uh, I think it was the walls of the temple, it, the people are going to continue in oblivion, ignorance, heading the wrong direction. 
Now, what he says here is that, okay, now the Lord's going to bring a charge against you. And the charge here has this connotation of a lawsuit against them. He's making this case. He begins listing their sins against them. Verse 2, by swearing and lying and killing and stealing and committing adultery, they break all restraint with bloodshed upon bloodshed. So they're breaking the Ten Commandments. We have five of them listed here. And he just, you know, enumerates them very quickly. Verse 3, therefore the land will mourn and everyone who dwells there will waste away with the beasts of the field and the birds of the air, even the fish of the sea will be taken away from you. So things continue to head towards chaos, towards entropy, towards this inevitable problematic end that they had been warned against for so long. Or again, always Deuteronomy 30 comes back, verse 19, 20 around there. You know, I, I set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. You know, so choose, he says, but I want you to choose the better way. But no, they don't. And so they continue heading towards these, the, the negative side of these things, the, the side that nobody in their right mind would say that that's what they want, but they fail to do. And because of this, you know, everything just starts falling apart and wasting away. And, and we can see how you know, the beasts of the field and the birds of the air can all disappear, sometimes through faults of our own, okay? But it, it starts talking about even the fish of the sea will be taken away. And, and I know that we can even over overfish certain areas to the point where they say, oh, you know, the, the numbers are getting low, but the reality is they don't know for sure because, you know, you give it a few years or more and they come back and, or, or they were just over so far. And I say this because the sea is, is one of the more difficult things for us to conquer the depths of the sea and, and to find these things and get to these things and to see these things you know, that are in the sea it is, it's, this is the more difficult, but he says, even the fish of the sea are going to be taken away. And ultimately, in Revelation 16, 3, we see that when the second angel pours out the bowl on the sea, that every living creature in the sea dies. And before that, in chapter 8, we saw that a third of them died. So it appears that, okay, everything is going to come to naught, okay? And it's going to be during the day of the Lord, during God's recompense on man because of their broken laws. And again, there's a way that leads to death, and there's a way that leads to life. Choose life, please, he says. But nope, we're going to see that even the land is going to reflect the way that you act. Okay, and I'm, I'm going to begin removing my protection and blessings from it while you're there. And, and that's what a lot of people misunderstand, is that we all think that we're great that we do these things, that we're completely in charge. But no, th th there's, there's so many things that are so completely out of our control that God sees or oversees so that he can give us, as it were, rain in due season and so on and so forth. Verse 4 of Hosea 4. Now let no man contend or rebuke another, for your people, people are like those who contend with the priest. Okay, and, and that's not something that we can just take lightly here. Let's look at Deuteronomy 17 and verse 12. Again, single verse. I can read it for you if you like. Deuteronomy 17 verse 12 says, Now the man who acts presumptuously. Okay, remember that. How he's, he's acting presumptuously. And will not heed the priest who stands to minister there before the Lord your God or the judge, that man shall die. So you shall put away the evil from Israel. So here he is, he's saying, okay, don't contend or rebuke another, for your people are like those who contend with the priest. Okay, that's, again, a pronouncement against the people that you don't want hanging over your head because the, the recompense, the 
the reality, <clears throat> what's going to happen for, the, as it were, the sentence for doing this is death. So if you don't heed the priest, okay, who is a minister of God, who's supposed to be trying to help you to understand God, who's showing you God's way. And again, it's not the priest who's just pulling this out of thin air. It's the priest who's been trained. It's specifically in the law of God here to tell them how they need to act. So it's not the priest. It's the priest telling, okay, on the authority of God. Well, it says that man shall die. And again, this is why he says you can't have a rotten apple in the barrel. You got to put away evil from the land, from Israel, from the people, out of their sight. You don't do that. Okay, but he's saying, okay, you know, you guys don't take it upon yourselves to contend or rebuke another. All right, you, you don't even have it right in the first place. Okay, and, and the problem is, is that you know we're trying to paint this chronological steps in, in terms of how you get to this place, but everything's happening all over the place, and it, it's a, a mess, it's a hodgepodge of people doing what's right in their own eyes and not following God. And among other things, they think they know better. They're contending with the priests. They're the ones who are acting, okay? They're, they're as it were, choosing of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. They're taking judgment to themselves, and they're not choosing of the tree of life. All right, so what happens when, whenever you, know, you do this? Well, it's not within man to guide himself. And because of that, it is a way that leads to death. And, and yet, you know, the Israelites here, the, the, the people of the northern ten tribes of Israel, are happy to continue in that direction. Now, here's the other problem, and this is a big problem, is that Jeroboam, whenever they broke off, you know, he began rejecting the holy days right away. Again, let's go ahead and look at that quickly in 1 Kings 13, 33. I know I always mention this, but I figure let's go ahead and put it in, in writing and notes as we you know upload them to the, the internet, make it a little more easily searchable and findable if anybody ever wants to find out, as opposed to just saying this all the time, because I don't think we've ever gone through and said, okay, let, let's talk about Jeroboam. And still, this is not necessarily doing it justice. But we'll get to see who... who and what the man Jeroboam is. 1 Kings 13, 33, it says, After this event, Jeroboam did not turn from his evil way, but again, he made priests from every class of people for the high places. Whoever wished, he consecrated him, and he became one of the priests of the high places. All right, so, again, I laugh because he's, they made priests of everyone. You know, in our former organization, that's what happened. As soon as we left, it's like they were desperate for priests. They made anybody and everybody who put their hand up a priest. And most of them were not qualified to be priests. Because, I mean, if they had been, they would have been before. But, anyway, he says he did evil, and he made them priests for the high places, which, which is even worse. Okay, oh yeah, you want to be a minister? Oh yeah, I want to be a minister of God. And so then, it's not for God. And, and the, at the temple, right? We're going to make these other high places, which we'll talk about here in just a bit. He says, whoever, they consecrated them. And, and if you go back at chapter 12, to chapter 12, verse 33, it says, so he made offerings on the altar which he had made at Bethel on the 15th day of the eighth month in the month which he devised in his own heart. He ordained a feast for the children of Israel, offered sacrifices on the altar, and burned incense. So again, he moved the holy day of God, in particular here, which one happens on the seventh month and the 15th day, Feast of Tabernacles. But he says, we're going to celebrate it a month later because he's trying to control the people, trying to keep them up in Israel, not go down to Jerusalem. He says, okay, and he wants to change things. And so he just gets way out of hand. And again, doing this at Bethel, which means house of God, it's a place where they were supposed to be doing uh, righteous sacrifices. And again, it says he ordained a feast. Okay, Jeroboam made up this feast and he offered these wrongful sacrifices and he had these priests that were not priests doing these things for them. Because the Levites, 
saw this, right? And if you want, just put Second Chronicles eleven thirteen through 17 in your notes. It just says that the Levites who were in Israel at that time, okay, they went back to Judah and to Jerusalem because Jeroboam had rejected them from serving as priests because they were saying, okay, no, 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 Jeroboam, you, this is the way you're supposed to do it. And Jeroboam said, nope, I'm going to do it the way I want. And so he, he appointed the, the priests that he had for high places. And, and it even says for the demons, which is interesting because that's what it's for. Because there is only one God, any sacrifice you make to anything else is either to, you know, a little wooden carved idol or something made out of stone, ostensibly led by Satan and the demonic realm. And so, yeah, that, that's the little g God of this world, who is not really a God. But anyway, so all of, the, uh, all of these Levites being spoken of here return to Judah, and because of this, you know, Rehoboam prospered. And they, they strengthened the kingdom of Judah, which is interesting, the terminology that is there, is that it's through the Levites and the way that they led the people to God that it strengthened the king of Judah. And so, yes, Judah was not going to, to fall. And, and again, there's another... Uh, a warning to Judah to not do what Israel that we'll come across here in just a moment. So back to Hosea verse four, I mean, chapter four, verse five. Therefore, you shall stumble in the day. The prophet also shall stumble with you in the night, and I will destroy your mother. So to me, Proverbs twenty nine eighteen is what comes to mind. Proverbs twenty nine verse eighteen, and again, kind of a memorization verse. In the King James Version, the way I initially learned it, it says, Where there is no vision, the people perish, but he that keepeth the law happy is he. So the, the New King James says, Where there is no revelation, the people cast off restraint. Which immediately makes me think of Hosea 4, verse 2, which we already read, is that, you know, okay, by the, the these commandments that they were breaking, that they break all restraint. They're not restrained within the law of God, this narrow road that we are to walk. It doesn't mean that they're burdensome because we know that they are not. Okay, First John 5, 3, I think it is, says his commandments are not burdensome and they're not. In fact, they're they're very free making. They, they cast off, uh, again, the, the, the penalties that come with breaking the law. So it, it frees you from those penalties, those problems. But happy is he who keeps the law. So again, it's a proverb of Solomon that he's imparting wisdom saying, okay, look, God has revealed these things to you. If you going to say, okay, I don't want God's way, then you're going to perish. That Again, there's a way that leads to death. And... If you are happy with that, then okay, by all means, continue in that direction. And so this is what was happening with the people when they didn't have the, the priests to lead them and did what was right in their own eyes. But it says also, the prophet also shall stumble. So meaning they're going to become false prophets. Again, if they're stumbling, they're not doing what's right and they don't know what's right. And again, we were talking to everybody in the land here. And so they pretend to stand for God, but they tell the people things that are, say, commensurate with their lack of understanding. So they say, okay, yeah, by all means, go up and, you know, make sacrifices in the, the this false pagan temple. But the thing is, here's the thing that we need to understand today is that this is what's happening now, that there are many people like this, okay, there are many, okay, priests and prophets. Okay, there, again, there are these men out there who claim to be prophets who are not prophets, who are telling people what they want to hear, or telling people not according to the word of God, who are telling people these things just so that they can get money and materialism or get followers and get power, and, you know, all these other things that they shouldn't be going for. Yet, 
they do not tell the people what is truly in the word of God. So the people then, they turned away from God. And because of this, Israel, for over 2,500 years, would, for all intents, be away from this mother, the motherland. They would not have the, the leaders, you know, the, the nation that goes with them as the people of Israel. And so there's a, so that for all intents and purposes, yes, the mother is destroyed, right? So again, if you want, just put Hosea 2.2, 2, we talked about that already earlier in terms of uh, who the mother was. But also in Isaiah 50 and verse 1, again, it says that, and it's the Lord speaking, says, where is the certificate of your mother's divorce whom I put away? So again, he put them away, gave them this bill of divorcement. So in effect, here it is, there's this separation that is going on. They, they do not have this marital covenant between the two of them anymore. And all the promises that went with it, all the things that God said he would do, are no longer binding because there's been this breach of the contract. And so, yes, in, in this effect, yeah, the mother is destroyed. But again, I, I don't want to get into it completely because we do know that this was not their only chance, that they did not have the Spirit of God, that they will in the future have a chance to, quote-unquote, have this relationship with Christ, again, who was uh, like a husband to them. Now, Hosea 4 and verse 6, kind of, uh, again, this is a, a memorization verse, and it's an interesting verse, and it's an integral verse, and it's one that we understand this very central um, concept and idea around which we can work. So Hosea 4 and verse 6 says, My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. And let me just say very quickly that destroyed again, comes from this word that kind of means to be dumb, as in, you know, can't talk or silent. And so they, they fail or they, they perish, right? So again, it's not this complete and utter destruction. Of course, God can, even if he, he kills them all or lets them all die, he can bring them back to life. But he's saying, and again, ultimately though, let's be clear that if you don't have this knowledge of God and live by it, then yes, you ultimately will die the second death from which there is no return. So he says, okay, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Th this is very simple, straightforward, what we have to understand. Because you have rejected knowledge, okay, my knowledge, the knowledge of God and his ways, his statutes, his judgments, his commandments, precepts, word, etc., I also will reject you from being priest for me because you have forgotten the law of your God. I also will forget your children. So again, he says, okay, my people, that's everyone, including the priests and prophets as well, if they reject the knowledge of God, right? And this is the way he started off the chapter in, in verses one and two, right? He says, there's no truth or mercy, or knowledge of God. Okay, we're not talking about any type of secular knowledge or special uh, knowledge that's not in the Bible. Okay, we're talking about this moral law that God has given to his people, given to the world, for that matter of fact. But in, in particular, he's addressing his people, the nation of Israel, the northern ten tribes more specifically. And it's he's telling them, he said, okay, is this knowledge that you're rejecting? And because of it, there is an end to it. So if you're going to turn away your ear from hearing the law, then there are going to be consequences that follow. And again, if you don't know the law, you don't believe it, you don't follow it, meaning do it, 
then yes, this is what's going to happen. Even to the point of forgetting your children. Again, that this is cause and effect, really. This is what's happening whenever you have children, all right, that they're not being taught either. And because of this, there's going to be this separation between God and them, right? Because if they sin, and they will be sinning, okay, the people are sinning, their children are sinning because the children haven't been taught, the children don't know either. And so what happens is, and then, as we talk about before many times in Isaiah 59, 1 and 2, it's, and this happens, and it's a concept that happens throughout the whole Bible, then God says, I won't hear you, okay? He says, it's not that my ears are stopped up or my arm is too short, it's the sins that separate you from me. So again, yes, they're going to be moved away and put them to the side for now and, as it were, forget them. Verse 7, the more they increased, the children talking about, the more they sinned against me. I will change their glory into, into shame. So God's going to eventually stop this cycle of perpetuation, you know, in terms of the glory into shame, right? They're, they're going to reap the results of the way that they acted and eventually end up into captivity. So he go, they go from being my people and the glory that happened, having a God that led them, one, and the nations knew about all the things that they did and how their God was with them and all the miracles he performed. So from this glory into the shame to where they become these people going, oh, how the mighty have fallen and where is their God? And again, a, a shameful situation when you consider where they started. They eat up the sin of my people. They set their heart on their iniquity. This is verse 8 of Hosea 4. One of the things that the priests got to do was to have a portion of certain sacrifices to eat. And you can look that up back in Leviticus 6 and 7 around there. It says the priests right here were more focused on getting food for themselves and telling the people not to sin. And, and to a certain degree, it may have been a conflict of interest, so to speak, that, okay, well, if we tell the people their sins or, or we don't encourage them to change, then... You know, what are they going to you know, bring us then? So they were more interested in the food that they were bringing them and, and taking from them and perhaps even working them to a certain degree like the, the, uh, the Sunday morning preachers do where they try to get you to assuage your guilt by giving money. And, and I think even the Catholics have ways of buying yourself out of, out of hell or purgatory or limbo, whatever it is, that... They can, you can give money to get out of these things. And of course, they're going to encourage you. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You need to, you need to bring me more food. You need to bring me more money. And so, yes, they eat up the sin of the people. They set their heart on their iniquity. They, they set their heart on their sin, not on the fact that they need to be changing or need to be righteous and need to be doing what the law of God. So they're not conveying these things to the people. And this is part of the lack of knowledge for which they're all going to be destroyed. Verse 9, and it shall be like people, like priests, so I will punish them for their ways and reward them for their deeds. So like people, like priests, you know, all of them are going to be destroyed. We're talking about Hosea 4, 6, kind of this key verse, central thematic verse here, is that my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Let's turn over to Isaiah 9 real quick. Isaiah 9, verses 13 through 16. I want us to understand something here that, again, he's talking about the priests who are supposed to be the spiritual leaders. He talks about, in other places, the kings are supposed to be setting the example, leading the people, making sure that they follow the way of God and enforcing that. And he talks about the people, that they're supposed to do this. But, but then often... You know, we look and say, well, you know, the priests made me do it. The priests weren't doing what they were supposed to. How was I supposed to? Well, we do not get to cast off our personal responsibility ever. Let's notice this in Isaiah 9, verses 13 through 16. 
It says, For the people do not turn to him who strikes them, nor do they seek the Lord of hosts. Again, when God corrects and chastises, which is doesn't seem pleasant for the time being, the idea is to get our attention and for us to turn to him and to his ways, just like children turn to their parents. He says, verse 14, Therefore, because you're not doing this, because you're not turning to me, therefore the Lord will cut off the head and the tail from Israel, palm branch and bulrush in one day. So he's going to cut off the head and the tail from Israel. Well, who's the head and tail? Verse 15, the elder and honorable, he is the head. And the prophet who teaches lies, he is the tail. Right? So he's going to cut them off from Israel in one day. Right? So the leaders are going to have repercussions for not acting correctly. But notice this, verse 16. For the leaders of this people cause them to err. Aha, well, we see why they're getting cut off. So, you know, okay, that's, that's just, that's deserved. And notice who else? Those who are led by them are destroyed. The people who willingly follow leaders, again, talking about the civil and the religious ones, who even are putting out wrong information, are going to be destroyed because they did not do what they were supposed to do. They were, ha they were supposed to do due diligence. And they did not do that. So again, you cannot blithely and blindly follow a leader. You're not going to get into the kingdom of God on the coattails of the ministry. You cannot go into a congregation and say, oh, this is the church of God. This is a minister of God. I'm going to, I'm all, I'm all good now. No, you have a responsibility to measure and weigh everything up against the word of God. If you do not do that, you will reap the repercussions of it. And in this case, it's a destruction. You know, God's very clear about this. I'm not trying to make God to be out like this wrathful God because he's this loving, caring, compassionate God who wants the best for you. He wants to lead you in this way. He wants to give you life and blessings. But you have to go this way. So he doesn't want to destroy you symbolically, temporarily, and especially not permanently. And so he does these things to try to get your attention to bring you around. So back to Hosea in verse 10. Hosea 4, verse 10. So these next five verses, again, harken back to the spiritual harlotry, harlotry that Israel is committing. Verse 10, Hosea 4:10. For they shall eat, but not have enough. They shall commit harlotry, but not increase, because they have ceased obeying the Lord. Again, we keep talking about the blessings and cursings, right? Is Again, we talk about them eating, but it not being filling or satisfying or, or just not enough. You know, we were talking about that over in Haggai uh, before. Okay, the, the, the land is, is not reaping what it should. Haggai 1 verse 6 says, You have sown much and bring in little. You eat, but do not have enough. You drink, but you're not filled with drink. You clothe yourselves, but no one is warm. And he who earns wages, earns wages to put in a bag with holes. So again, here's what's, ha what's, what's going on. It goes on throughout the Bible. Blessings and cursings. So it talks also, again, that they commit harlotry, but they don't increase. So in a sense, there's this moratorium on the blessings that God uh, has promised to Abraham, right? In fact, in, Ho in Hosea 1 and verse 10, we already talked about it. It says, yet the number of the children of Israel shall be of the sand of the sea and cannot be measured or numbered. And so, again, we saw that it was a promise to Abraham, back in Genesis 13, 16, where your descendants are going to be the dust of the earth. And he, he continues that promise and reiterates it to Jacob, says, you know, in Genesis 32, 12, that uh, you're not going to be able to be numbered. You're going to be as the sand of the sea. And, and he's saying that you guys, though, 
are committing harlotry, having kids. But I'm going to put this moratorium on because of your disobedience. And that's the way it works. In Deuteronomy 28, Leviticus 26, blessings come with obedience, cursings come with disobedience. It's cause and effect, very black and white here. So he's saying, you know, yeah, you're not going to continue to multiply and to become big and to become powerful and to become my people if that's what you're going to do. He says in verse 11, because harlotry, wine, and new wine enslave the heart. So they've become addicted to these things, literally, and, and I'm sure more. And to me, the implication here is that they can't even wait for the wine to go all the way through the fermenting process. So they're going to drink wine and they're going to drink the new wine. You know, one of the hardest things about, about wine, for me anyway, is waiting till it matures, right? Because you, you got to bottle it up. And then even sometimes when you buy it from uh, the, the, the salesman, it's not ready to drink fully. It's going to become a lot better. So some of these things don't age. I mean, they don't even re reach their potential for 15 or 25 years. And so you have to take care of it, nurture it, turn it, you know, quarter turn all the time, make sure the cork doesn't become all dry and that it doesn't turn to vinegar and, and whatnot. And so, again, you can see why they go, yeah, we're not going to wait. Okay, we, we've drunk all the other wine. Now we need to drink the new wine. And so that, to me, seems to be the implication here is that, you know, they're so enslaved to it. And we know what Romans 6.16 says is that we are slaves to whomever we obey. So you can be slaves to sin, which leads to death, or you can be slaves to righteousness, which leads to life. So again, don't underestimate these things. Yet they did, and they were headed in the wrong direction. They were eating, drinking, being happy, being merry, thinking everything's all fine, because when they did it, the problems that ensue with the, those type, that type of lifestyle didn't immediately hit them. And they were able to go on for some time before God says, okay, now's the time for punishment. Verse 12 of Hosea 4. My people ask counsel from their wooden idols and their staff informs them for the spirit of harlotry has caused them to stray and they've played the harlot against their God. So they ask this counsel of wooden idols, they, and their staff informs them. It's talking about divination and and uh, idolatry. Now, again, the, the spirit of harlotry that's being talked here. You know, this is what we talked about in the first two chapters, where Hosea was a type of Christ that marries a woman of har harlotry. And this is what God's saying to them: "You're playing the harlot." You know, back in um, in chapter one of Hosea, verses you, you can go back and you know review it. Verses 2, 6, and 9, he tells them, okay, here are the kids and here's the symbols behind it. You know, you're committing harlotry. And he said, because of that, I'm not going to have mercy on you, right? And this is, again, what was he talking about then at the beginning of chapter 4? He says, there's no truth or mercy or knowledge of God in the land. Again, to have mercy, you must show mercy. Okay, that's scriptural. He says, because of this, he says, okay, you're not my people and I will not be your God if this is the way you're going to act. So they went after foreign gods. They forsook the one and true God. They lost knowledge of him and his ways. And what was the result? My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Verse 13, Hosea 4, verse 13. They offer sacrifices on mountaintops and burn incense on hills and under oaks, poplars, and terebinths. Because their shade is good, therefore your daughters commit harlotry and your brides commit adultery. So again, they make these sacrifices on the mountaintops, in the high places, which quote-unquote are closer to heaven. Again, this is an allusion to the pagan worship and the pagan sacrifices that they were doing. I mean, let's look at Jeremiah 2, verses 19 and 20 real quick. Jeremiah 2, verses 19 and 20. And again, we will, you know, focus here. I mean, again, this is in reference to what we're talking about on the mountaintops. 
and incense on the hills under the oaks and poplars and terebinths. He says, your own wickedness will correct you and your backsliding will rebuke you. Know therefore and see that it is an evil and bitter thing that you have forsaken the Lord your God and the fear of me is not in you, says the Lord of hosts. Again, if there was fear in the people of Israel, then they would have done what was right. Again, we're talking about a proper reverent fear of God to say, okay, yes, I, I, I understand who you are, how great you are, and you've given me this better way to be and that I need to do that. But nope, they didn't fear God. For Jeremiah 2.20, of old, I have broken your yoke, burst your bonds, and, I, and you said, I will not transgress. When on every high hill and under every green tree, you lay down playing the harlot. So we see then that this, this is what God's talking about, this spiritual harlotry that's going on. Again, that is not wanting to have the relationship with God, but wanting to have it with foreign pagan gods that are not really gods. And let's, let's just, well, let me just read 2 Chronicles 31 and verse 1 for you. I just wanted to make this point of under the oaks, poplars, and terebinths. And let me just read from the King James Version. It says, Now, when all of this was finished, all Israel that were present went out to the cities of Judah and break the images in pieces and cut down the groves. All right, so the groves are these places where the trees have been planted in a specific way for a specific purpose. So when we talk about here, it says, under the oaks and poplars and terebinths, because their shade is good, these were purpose-planted trees and areas in the high places, these groves, for the purpose of offering to pagan gods. He says, okay, so he says, here he says, uh, let me just start over. Now when all this was finished, all Israel that were present went out to the cities of Judah and they broke the images in pieces and cut down the groves. Okay, because this is bad. This is this is why they're cutting down the trees. They threw down the high places where they had their their uh, all these groves and the altars and where they're doing the the sacrifices. The high places connotation to pagan areas of worship. Whenever you see that, and the altars out of all of Judah and Benjamin and Ephraim and Manasseh until they had utterly destroyed them all. Then all the children of Israel returned every man to his possession in their own cities. So, so again, this was said this is in a good way. Okay, They were supposed to be cutting down these, these groves. And the interesting thing is, is that the word here for groves is Asherah or Astarte or Ashtoreth. It was this Phoenician goddess that they were worshiping. And, and again, we see derivations of, of Easter and Astarte and how that's where that came from. And so, again, this is how far Israel had progressed in the wrong direction when God had given them specific instructions of how to do all these things and how to worship him and the days to worship him on. And they just started committing this spiritual harlotry. And it also seems, too, that there may have been here at this point a, a, a physical harlotry that was going on. So what was happening here is that at the end of this verse here in verse 13, it says, therefore your daughters commit harlotry and your brides commit adultery. So it seems though, okay, and again, this certain assumption is that while the men were away doing these things that they shouldn't have been doing is that the women were also taking some liberties. These, the, in fact, more than likely the same liberties of committing this these sexual improprieties that the men were committing. Notice the next verse, Hosea 4 and verse 14. It says, I will not punish your daughters when they commit harlotry. All right, so they're committing it in the, the verse before, or your brides when they commit adultery. Why? For the men themselves go apart with harlots and offer sacrifices with a ritual harlot. Therefore, people who do not understand will be trampled. Now, one of the things that happened back in ancient times were these this concept of a temple prostitute. Again, it was a way of incentivizing the men to go to the temple and to make the sacrifices and to give these things was that, okay, 
there were prostitutes up there that you got to sleep with if you went up there and did these things. So again, the, the ones who were doing this, again, all motivated by Satan, were no dummies in terms of trying to entice them in there. But while they were there, the women did the same things. But God says, okay, I'm holding the men more accountable than the women. Therefore, it says, the people who do not understand, okay, this would be all inclusive, whoever doesn't understand, will be trampled. And the word there has this connotation of fall, as this fall from grace, as some say today, a meaning of falling from a position of favor into a position of sin. So continuing on in verse 15, it says, Though you, Israel, play the harlot, let not Judah offend. Do not come up to Gilgal, nor go up to Beth-Avon, nor swear an oath, saying, as the Lord lives. So again, here's the admonition that we referred to from before, is that he's telling Judah, says, look, don't do what Israel's doing. Okay, Don't come up to Gilgal, this place of worship, or to Beth-Avon, which means... Uh, this house of vanity, this house of iniquity or sin is this literal translation. And it appears to be sarcastic as a reference to Bethel, which means house of God. So again, they had made it into, you know, the den of thieves, as it were. And he says, okay, don't, don't do what they're doing, nor swear an oath saying, as the Lord lives. All right. So don't just go around saying as the Lord lives. It's more important, you know, that you don't you know, say Lord, Lord, but that you do what you're supposed to to do. Verse 16, for Israel is, a, is stubborn like a stubborn calf. Now the Lord will let them forage like a lamb in the open country. Again, the, the King James version says Israel slides back as a backsliding, okay, as this rebellious and unrestrained heifer. And so now the Lord's going to feed them as a lamb in a large place. And I don't think that the con that's a good connotation because a lamb in an open country is not safe. So I think this is a, a reference to them in Israel going into Assyria. Is that, okay, like a single lamb in a large pasture, this is not a good thing. Then verse 17 of Hosea says, Ephraim is joined to idols, let him alone. Now Ephraim is a representative of the ten tribes of Israel. You know, if you remember back in Genesis 48, that Israel, okay, Jacob became Israel. So he's talking about Israel, the man. He stretched out his right hand and put it on Ephraim, knowingly. And he said, you know, let my name be named upon him. And so then Ephraim became the firstborn, quote unquote, of Israel. He received that blessing, that special blessing. And so often Ephraim is used to reference the 10 tribes, and that differentiates Israel from all of Israel, meaning the 12 tribes. But also, you know, always keep in mind that Ephraim can represent the commonwealth as well. And it says that he is, Ephraim is joined to idols. And according, this is the continual, perpetual problem of the people of God in the Old Testament. You know, put Ezekiel 20 verses 16 through 18, in, or 16 through 20 in your notes. Again, you know, they went into captivity. Their problems were idolatry and they profaned the Sabbath. They didn't keep the whole law of God. Verse 18, Hosea 4, verse 18 says, their drink is rebellion. They commit harlotry continually. Her rulers dearly love dishonor. So he's continuing to make this case for why they're going to be punished. And again, you see these terms come up again that, okay, they're rebellious. They're committing harlotry. The, the rulers are not ruling the way that they're supposed to. And then finally, verse 19, the wind has wrapped up her in its wings and they shall be ashamed because of their sacrifices. So the wind has wrapped her up in this wing. Seems to be this allusion to the Assyrian armies that's going to come in like the wind, take over Israel very quickly. In spite of you know everything that they've done great in the past and who they were known to be in the past, it's going to you know fall very quickly, and they shall be ashamed because of their sacrifices. So after all that they did for their gods, little G, on the high places under the groves. 
sacrificing these great sacrifices to these gods who are not gods, they were not saved by them. So, of course, you know, they're going to be ashamed because, again, there is only one true God and idols of sticks and stones will and can never 